Mabuhay. Today, I'm going to talk about using Spanish period Catholic Church records in doing one's Filipino genealogy. The word genealogy may not be something that many Filipinos are familiar with, but ask any Filipino about his or her family, and they can tell you quite a lot of stories about this and that famous and infamous ancestor or relatives. Many researchers in the Philippines would also say that doing Filipino genealogy is tedious and sometimes not quite worth the work. They would say that records are not always available and what's available may not always tell them what they want to know. That is actually quite not true. Records are available, and in fact, over the years, many Filipino families have been able to trace their family trees thanks mainly to the records left by the Spaniards. I'm talking about the canonical records, or the church records that the Spanish friars were able to keep and preserve over the centuries of Spanish rule in the Philippines. Today, Many of these old Spanish church records can still be found in the repositories of old churches all over the Philippines. Unfortunately, though, not all of these churches have survived, and thus, not all of these old records can be found today. So before you start your research, it is best to pay these churches a visit and see if your hometown has been able to preserve its Spanish period church records. My earliest research into my family history was done in the parish office of my maternal family's hometown in Argao, Cebu. If you cannot physically visit your church, you can still check if they have records available using the catalog function of family search. There you can see if your hometown has been able to preserve its Spanish period church records. While well, there were several church records left by the Spaniards, I will only be discussing the three most common church sources in Philippine genealogical research, baptismal, matrimonial, and burial records, which are also known collectively as canonical or parochial records. These parochial records, or libros de canonicos, allow the Catholic Church to keep careful vital records and to keep track of the events of their parishioners' life. The beauty about these Spanish-era Philippine records is that one can get a lot of information when tracing one's family tree. Over the centuries, these records have changed, and its contents have also evolved over the years. According to renowned historian Michael Killinane, though there were already records kept as early as the late 1500s, the oldest existing parochial records date back to only 1621 in Lubao, Pampanga. Over the years, many records were lost or destroyed due to various reasons. The earliest records were written down on an inferior type of paper called at the time as papel de chino or china paper. This type of paper disintegrated only after a few years due to the country's humidity. So, from the 1800s onward, priests were directed to use a better quality paper called papel de europeo or European paper. Other causes for the loss of early baptismal and other canonical records include the various moral attacks and the burning of churches. But the biggest contributor to the loss of these wealth of information was the Second World War, when many of the churches in the Philippines were bombed and thus many of the old records were destroyed. So 
So our first type of record are baptismal records, or also known as libros de canonicos. These records mentioned, of course, the date of baptism, followed by the date of birth, and of course, the name of the child. In some cases, the order of birth was mentioned, thereby keeping track also of older siblings. And then the name of the parents and the godparents. The next records are matrimonial records, or libros de matrimonios, which mention the name of the bride and the groom, the date of the marriage, the parents of the couple, and the witnesses to the marriage. The third most common church record, burial records, or libros de entierros, listed the name of the deceased, the date of burial, the spouse of the deceased if married, or the parents if single, and the two types of causes of death at that time, either muerte natural or natural death, or muerte violenta, or a non-natural cause of death. So after seeing those three most common church records that you can use in tracing your Filipino genealogy, the question that you should now ask is, are Spanish period church records really that easy to use? In my personal opinion, I would admit that there were challenges when I first started using these parochial records in doing my family history. For one, you have to familiarize yourself with the many abbreviations and shortcuts found in these records. For instance, Enero was always shortened to EN, Febrero to FEB, Marzo or March to MAR, etc. But dates are quite easy to understand. Unfortunately, if you are not familiar with names, then you will be quite lost at the beginning of your research. For instance, Francisco would be usually written down as F-R-A-N with a superscript O to distinguish it from Francisca, which will have a superscript of A. Juan will be written down as J-U and Juana will be written down as J-U with a superscript of A. So I would advise that when you start doing your research using church records, familiarize yourselves with the most common Spanish names. Agustin, Jose, Pedro. These names were common and usually used all throughout the Philippines. So you would find these in most records. So if you have a list of all the Spanish period names that were common at that time, then that will be helpful when you do your research using church records. Basically, Spanish period church records are really quite easy to understand because even with the most basic knowledge of Spanish, just have a Spanish to English dictionary handy and even without one, these records were usually written down in templates or a certain pattern. So you would really need just the basic understanding of common Spanish words that were used in church records. To illustrate my point further, in the next few slides, we will look at baptismal records from different points in time to see what type of information are found in these records. This record is a baptismal record from the 1600s. In this example of a baptismal record from the 1600s, we can see that there are several names written down on a very tight space on one page. 
This was because the uh, early Spanish friars wanted to save the paper that they used for the baptismal records. So that's also one of the reasons why they crowded the names of the children that they baptized, especially if they were baptized on the same day. In this particular record, we can see, of course, the date of baptism, the day, the month, and the year, followed by the name of the child, the name of the mother and father, and the name of the godparent. At the end of each page, there is also the name of the parish priest or the priest who performed the baptism. By the 1700s, there was a clear change in the way that the entries were made. As seen in this particular baptismal record, there was no longer the crowding of the names into a tight space. So each person that was baptized or couple that were married or buried now had their own space on the page where their entry is written down. So aside from the usual information that were already found during the 1600s, in this particular record from the 1700s, we see, aside from the date, the name of the child, the name of the parents, and the name of the godparent, we already find the name of the parish or the pueblo or town where the child was baptized, and of course, the number of days old that the child is. So with these two additional information, we get more from a baptismal record than from those in the 1600s. In the 1800s, right before 1868, we also have two more additional information found on baptismal records. We have the racial classification of the child baptized as well as the name or the number of the barangay where the parents of the child lived. In 1868, the Spanish authorities decided to standardize these records. On January 11 of that year, Governor General José de la Gandara issued a decree requiring that all entries in parish registers use a standard template. Naturally, like many of the administrative orders of Manila, this did not take effect immediately. However, by and large, most parishes implemented this within the year. As noticed in this sample of a baptismal record after this decree, the baptismal entry has become longer and contains more information. In some towns, baptismal entries could sometimes take up more than one page. So if you are really very interested in researching your Filipino genealogy, then 1868 is the year that you should look forward to. Because this is the year, as mandated by that decree, that entries were now even longer and contained more information. So aside from the usual dates and names of the parents and the name of the child, we also have more information added here, such as the race, the place of birth, and the residence and occupation of the father and the mother. And of course, the names of the paternal and maternal grandparents, which also indicated the name, the place, the race, and their present residence, as well as their occupation, and if they were still alive or already deceased. Information was also given on the race, the place of birth and present residence, and occupation of the baptismal sponsors, as well as the names, the place of birth, and present residence and occupation of the two baptism witnesses who were part of the church. So the 1868 records, not just the baptismal, but also 
the matrimonial and the burial records now contain a wealth of information that would extend one's family tree even longer as long as these records are still alive. So from 1868 onwards, you can be assured of more than just the names of the parents, but also of the names of the grandparents as long as they are still available. So after 1868, one could expect more or less the same lengthy entries in most baptismal, matrimonial, and burial records from different places in the Philippines. Although, of course, there were some churches that would omit one or two of the information that were supposed to be there, such as the occupation of the parents, grandparents, etc. Uh, sometimes they also removed the order of birth and sometimes the time of birth. But in many cases, most of the church records after 1868 remained faithful to the template that was distributed all over the Philippines as indicated in that 1868 decree of Governor General Jose de la Gandara. So after the Spaniards left the Philippines and the Americans took over, uh, many of the churches all over the Philippines continued to use the same template, albeit shorter, but still the names of the grandparents, which is very important when tracing one's family tree, because that's just another generation higher in the family tree, uh, they were still included in the records that can be found up to the 20s or even the 30s, uh, when the Americans were already in power in the Philippines. Of course, much later, when the Americans introduced civil registration, uh, the names of grandparents were no longer included in the records. And even church records after the Spaniards left the Philippines and the Americans took over, later on also just mentioned the name of the parents and no longer the names of the grandparents. So that's where I want to end this particular discussion. There are more church records available for those who are very interested and serious about tracing their Filipino genealogy. But as a start, the baptismal, matrimonial, and burial records using the information found as seen in the past few slides we have shown are a very good start in tracing one's Filipino genealogy. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.